And our theme for our Spring Renewal series is Love Like That. How to use the profound power of love to renew your life. And something that also inspired uh, this two-week series for me is something we're calling this year our Evolved Communication Initiative. Um, This is something that we're really stepping into this year uh, to focus on improving our communications internally with one another in our relationships, with the divine, and in our communities, in the world. I don't know about you, but I think we could all use a little bit of improvement there. And so that inspired uh, this message today and and next week on how to use this profound power of love in our lives. And uh, I love how our founder describes the importance of love. Ernest Holmes said, love is the sole impulse for creation. And the one who does not have it as the greatest incentive in their life has never developed the real creative instinct. No one can swing out into the universal without love, for the whole universe is based upon it. Yes, love is that important. Yes, love is the most creative power in the universe. And yes, there is a power of love in this universe, and you can use it. We can use it. And when we use it consciously and with intention, allowing ourselves to not only live and practice love, but to be in the fullness of love, then I feel like we've got this thing called life dialed in a little bit better. Do you agree? You know, yet, since love is so important, it kind of begs the question, um, who teaches us about love? I invite you to ask yourself this morning, um, who taught you how to love for better or for worse. I have a dear friend, her name is Susan Collins. She's a practitioner in Southern California. And she once told me a story uh, that I loved about her dad taking her out to dinner unexpectedly one night. Uh, He took her to a very nice place. He opened the door for her. He waited before her food came, before he started scarfing down his own. And at one point he looked at her and he said, do you know why I'm doing this? She said, no. And he said to her, "Um, I'm doing this so that you know when someone takes you out how you should be treated. And that may sound a little old-fashioned to some of us, but for her, it bonded her heart to her father and taught her a lot about boundaries and expectations on how to be loved. I had an incredible couple in my life, like second parents to me, named Mary and Alan uh, Feldman. And they had this beautiful relationship together. And I learned so much about uh, love just by watching the two of them. And you know that there are are those couples who, even when they're bickering, it's kind of cute. They were were that kind of uh, a couple. And and, uh, they're so one to me. I can't remember who told me this, but one of them said that, you know, one of the secrets to our relationship is what I know about Alan and what I know about me is that none of us would intentionally do anything to hurt the other person. That was so powerful to me because it told me in my relationships, yeah, am I going to get hurt? Yes. Am I going to be in places of distrust? Yes. It's almost impossible when you're that intimate with someone not to feel hurt by the other person. But if I can remember that if it's never intentional, how easy, how much easier it is to come back to a place of love from a place of distrust or fear or hurt. Alan was an incredible hugger. He's passed away now. And uh, whenever he used to hug me or anyone, he would kind of do this uh, throat clearing thing, kind of a... <clears throat> and you, you just knew the tears were coming in you and in him. And, and so even today, when I'm acting from a place, especially in my relationship that's not of the highest love. I I don't hear Alan's voice, but I I feel him clearing his throat. throat) And what it's saying to me is, don't act like this, but love like that. Don't act like this, but love like that. Who taught you how to love? There are certainly many lessons that I learned about how to love that have been damaging to me, that have been really negative. Somewhere along the line, I learned the lesson 
that love is something to withhold from others when you're upset with them. That somehow love is something to withhold and instead give a cold shoulder or withdraw or even just be really passive aggressive. And I see how this false lesson about love has uh, created a lot of damage in certain relationships in my life. What grew out of this as well was sometimes the belief uh, that love um, isn't um, to be shared because it will make me feel too vulnerable. You know, that, that to really love is to leave yourself exposed. So it's not just kind of that male machismo. It's the idea that to really love someone is to risk breaking down. It's to risk the deepest kind of rejection. Who taught you how to love? And I think it leads to this question as well of who are you teaching how to love? Who are you teaching? There's so many different lessons that we've probably been taught. One of my favorite stories is a a short one that the great Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, told about growing up. And as a young boy, uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred, if you can imagine this, was, was greatly bullied. And he used to think uh, in those times when he was really feeling terrible about himself, he'd remember his, his grandfather, who whenever they'd spend the day together, at the close of the day, would look at young Fred and say, it was so special to spend this day with you. And I want you to know how incredibly special you are to me. And just that little lesson about love eventually grew into what I would argue would be the most successful television ministry of all time. It wasn't focused on adults. It was focused on children. It wasn't focused on salvation, but it was focused on letting each and every person know that you're special, that you matter, and yes, that I love you. One of my favorite presentations of Fred Rogers is very brief. He once won a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Emmys. And so he gets up there with all of these, you know, however we want to uh, stereotype stars in an audience. And he begins by saying, I, I want to begin by giving thanks for all the people who loved me so much to be here today. And I want to invite each of you here to take 10 seconds to think about those who loved you, who you wouldn't be here without their help go ahead and I'll keep the time. Isn't that a powerful feeling to remember who loved us, who taught us how to love? And wouldn't it be wonderful to think that some people in pondering that question might think of you and the influence that you had on their life? I want to share with you a few lessons that I've learned and am still learning about how to love. To don't act like this, but to love like that. And the first lesson is to remember that love is sacred. Love is sacred. Sounds obvious to many of us, but I think we can lose it along the way. And this word love, you know, it's four letters, but it means so much. Love can mean so many different things. Love can mean admiration. Love can mean romance. Love can mean tough love. Love can mean unconditional love. Love can be familial. Love can be romantic sensual, even a bit naughty sometimes. But it's got to be sacred. If it's not sacred, it's not love. I love how the musician Billy Bragg sang it one time. He said, do you know what lust is? Lust is when you put your own needs above someone else's. And do you know what love is? Love is when you put someone else's needs above your own. And to me, this isn't an act of self-sacrifice. It's that ability to recognize the divine in ourselves in another person and to call it forth. It's to recognize their preciousness, their specialness, as Mr. Rogers would call it. But for us, it's that recognition of the divine spark, to honor it, 
to call it forth. It's one of the great spiritual and human gifts that each of us has. In any moment, you can choose to love. Why the hell would we choose anything else when we know we're connected with that sacred power? To know that each of us has that ability to recognize the sacred in someone else and to call it forth if we're willing to take that little love risk. You know, sometimes we don't feel love. We're not in love. And the best thing to do in that moment is to try practicing love. To love the moment you're in and to know when you love that moment, you have that ability to love anyone who comes inside of it. I love how my friend Randy Ferguson, a congregant here at Mile High Church, wrote a wonderful book called The Opening. He puts it simply. He says, the moment you give love, you're in love. The moment you give love, you're in love. And he also says, in this higher place of consciousness, loving ourselves and others is both the key to fulfillment and the natural expression of who we are. It's that simple, and yet I don't know about you, it's really easy for me to forget. To forget to love. To put something else first, which always causes me to stumble, but when I can come back to love and remember, I can bring back that spark that might feel missing from my marriage. I can bring back myself from a sense of mediocrity in relationships, from a a tiredness, a laziness that doesn't destroy our relationships, but it, but it, it nicks them here or, or there. We have to always remember to, to love and something I like to use to remind me, um, I call it the Tao of Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> and uh, Rodney Dangerfield was famous for his marriage jokes, most of which are inappropriate to share from this stage. But, you know, the great thing about comedy is when it has that little kernel of truth in it, that, that, that's what really makes you, makes you laugh. And like Norman Lear said, when we laugh, we are one. I think that's so true. But uh, sometimes I know if the jokes are resonating too much, it's time to go, go back to love. You know, so it might go something like this. My, my wife asked me to take out the garbage. And I said, uh, don't worry, honey, I already did this morning. And she said, that's okay. I just want you to go outside and keep an eye on it. We sleep in separate rooms. We eat dinner alone. We take our vacations separately. Anything to save our marriage. I get get no respect at this Mile High Church, I tell you. And my personal favorite, my wife and I were happy for 20 years, and then we met. So too much of this can, can, can help remind us to come back to love. I love how Aeneas Nin put it. She said, love never dies a natural death. Love never dies a natural death. It dies because we don't know how to replenish its source. It dies of blindness and errors and betrayals. It dies of illness and wounds. It dies of weariness, of witherings, of tarnishings. And yet love, when we choose to consciously practice it, can restore anything, can bring back that divine spark if we're simply willing to courageously, boldly, intimately, vulnerability filledly <laughs> love the people we care about. Not just going through the motions of saying I love you when you're supposed to say it or buying the gift on the birthday, but infusing it with that recognition that love is sacred. The second lesson that I'm still learning, but it's become very important to me in my life. And it's that love is timeless. I've come to believe wholeheartedly in my life that love is timeless. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that I have learned that those moments in which I truly love last forever. Those moments when I'm just going through the motions, they fade away. Those moments where I'm just being pissy, not present, they fade away. Those moments when I'm in a place of victimhood, of anger, or or hurt, they can even fade away. But those moments in which I truly love 
are etched in the soul in such a way that they never go away. That I can be reminded over and over again, yes, I can't travel through the past and time travel to go through them again, but I don't need to because those moments of love are right there, always. This has been important with people who are still with me today, that I still have the honor of being in active relationships with, but it's just as important with people I know and love that have passed on to realize that the moments of love we built together never fade away because that love exists somewhere with our spirits in eternity. I've had the honor of doing so many different memorial services and I don't try to talk a lot during them, but something I always try to say if I can is that when I I lose someone I love, the first thing that I'm reminded of is how much I love that person. It hits, hits me like a ton of bricks. And there's something that's beautiful and honoring about that and there's something that's devastating about that because I've recognized that that way in which I used to love them as a physical being is no longer available to me. But that mourning it turns into a kind of depression when I somehow convince myself that just because the person I love is no longer here in the way they used to be, that that somehow means that I can't love them anymore. And so I remember to keep loving my loved one, to love them by doing things they love to do, to love them by loving the people that they loved, to love them whenever I miss them, whatever activity I may be engaged in, and to realize, to be at least slightly open to the idea that somewhere they're receiving that love and reciprocating it back to me. What did Wesley and the Princess Bride say? Not even death can stop true love. It can only delay it for a little while. One of my favorite romantic stories uh, actually involves someone after they had uh, passed on. It's the story of Bill um, Wooden and his uh, incredible, John Wooden, I apologize, and his incredible life, wife Nellie, uh, together for 60 years, married for 56 years. Nellie passed away, and I know for all of us it's different when we lose a partner. Sometimes we're called eventually to build a new relationship. John was, was getting up there, and he wasn't having any of that, and so he kept even though it meant immense grief for him, he kept his love for Nellie going. At one point, a journalist wanted to write a book with him about uh, their relationship, and it had been 10 years since she passed, and he knocked on the door and wouldn't open with tears in his eyes. I'm just not ready yet. A beautiful and famous Sports Illustrated article written by Rick Riley shares a practice that Wooden continued on for the rest of his days. On Tuesday, the best man I know will do what he always does on the 21st of the month. He'll sit down and pen a love letter to his best girl. He'll say how much he misses her and loves her and can't wait to see her again. Then he'll fold it once, slide it in a little envelope, and walk into his bedroom. He'll go to the stack of love letters sitting there on her pillow, untie the yellow ribbon, place the new one on top, and tie the ribbon again. The stack will be 180 letters high then, because Tuesday is 15 years to the day since Nellie, his beloved wife of 53 years, died. In her memory, he sleeps only on his half of the bed, only on his pillow, only on top of the sheets, never between, with just the old bedspread they shared to keep him warm. That timeless aspect of love that we can always return to because it never leaves us should be the reminder to have as many moments of practicing that profound love as possible because for me, it's that bridge to what is eternal, to our own eternal lives, finding that practice through love. A third lesson about love is that love has to be received in order to be given. Love has to be received in order to be given. And earlier, you know, talking about lust, I was kind of referring to the people that we might call takers. People who always want to get their needs met first before doing anything for anybody else. But I would argue that these aren't good receivers of love, that their taker aspect is actually a defense mechanism against receiving love in a meaningful and powerful way. 
And so I think many of us have a lot of work to do when it comes to receiving real, authentic, life-inspiring, soul-stirring love. I've been engaging in a spiritual practice these last few months. Uh, Just in my meditation in the morning, I asked myself two questions. Josh, how willing are you to love today? And how willing are you to be loved today? I invite you to ask yourself those two questions right now. How willing are you to love today? And how willing are you to be loved today? And what I know in my life is when the answer is a wholehearted, resounding yes, I'm living in that perfect flow with life. Love moves in and all around, and that creative medium is at work, continuing to nurture and cultivate a life of love and abundance and meaning. But what I learned in this practice is that the answer is no or not quite yes a lot more than I think. How willing am I to love today? Well, you know, I'm a little fearful of rejection. You know, my, my partner said something that stung a little bit, and I'm in a kind of a place of distrust. How willing am I to be loved today? You know, I'm a little angry with this person. I, I, I think if they, they tried to love me, I might deflect it or reject it. Oh, I'm having this kind of conflict at, at, at work, and I, I'm, I'm withdrawing, I'm withheld. And so when the answer was coming up, no, too many days in a row, I know that there's work to do. Work of forgiveness, work of boundary setting, work of being willing to have a courageous conversation because if it's going to get you back to love, it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, to realize that I have no interest in spending any time, wasting any time, not living from that place of love. And when I'm able to get back, there's a third question that I've been asking myself longer, but it's so meaningful to me, and and it's how can I best love today? How can I best love myself today? How can I best love my life today? How can I best love my wife today? Buy her some flowers, send her a text message, give her an hour free from being a mom. How can I best love my children whatever it may be. And what I've learned is sometimes I maybe don't figure out what the best answer is, but I've never gone wrong to practice that act of love. How willing am I to love today? How willing am I to be loved? And how can I best love? When we can say yes to those answers and act on it, we're living in that incredible creative flow of life. And so as kind of a closing process today, I just invite us to bring our understanding of our divinity to mind and to heart, to bring our God to mind and heart and to, and to ask in relationship with our God, how willing am I to love God today? How willing am I to be loved by God today? How can I best love God today? And whatever that is, love like that. I invite you to bring perhaps your most intimate relationship to mind, that person who you consider yourself closest with, and ask yourself, how willing am I to love you today? How willing am I to be loved today? Identify if there is a not quite yes there and make a commitment to do something about it by asking the question, how can I best love you today? And whatever answer that is, love like that. I invite you to bring to mind someone perhaps who you aren't seeing eye to eye with, someone you care about, that you might be in conflict with, How willing am I to love you today? How willing am I to be loved by you today? Is there any work to be done? My my son keeps not filling the ice trays in the morning when I want to make my smoothie, and so I I take it as an opportunity to to get a little angry, but to to love him. (laughs) 
to say, hey, I love you, I forgive you as I refill those ice trays. And sometimes that's the answer to the question, how can I best love you today? And whatever answer that is, love like that. And just lastly, bring yourself to mind. Hold your own self-image in your mind and your heart and ask, how willing am I to love you today? How willing am I to be loved by you? How can I best love you today? And whatever that is, love like that. Ernest Holmes also said, we should believe that God is the invisible partner in our lives and affirm that divine love goes before us and prepares the way. We should permit ourselves to be guided for there's something within us deep at the center of our being which knows what we ought to do and how we ought to do it. Don't act like this, but love like that.